side. Uh, my name's Ian, Ian Massingham. I work in the same team as Julian, uh, but I'm not specifically focused on AI and deep learning. I'm a general developer evangelist uh, working across a wider variety of different AWS services. Uh, but I do have one topic area in uh, this AI deep, deep learning track that I'm going to talk about today, which is about conversational interfaces and how we uh, apply uh, deep learning into natural language processing in order to build these kinds of systems. Uh, there's one important caveat about this talk, and it's an important caveat that unfortunately is a bit of an issue here in Germany I discovered last week when I gave this talk. So who here uses Facebook? You can tell me, it's fine. I know there's a bit of embarrassment about using Facebook right now, but it's necessary that you use Facebook in order to make my demo work, OK? So I'll, even if you don't use Facebook, I'm asking you if later on you'll just use Facebook and we'll just pretend you didn't use it, OK? Just for a little while, just to make this demo work. It's Facebook Messenger, OK? Uh, and there's an interactive component to this session where I want to get you interacting with one of these systems uh, so you can get a feel for what the user experience is like and also how we deliver uh, features in a system like this. So if you can break your Facebook embargo just for a few minutes, that would really kind of make this work a lot better. Please, please, please do that. OK. So uh, how do we get here? Uh, why did we build a tool to make it easier for developers to establish uh, conversations with their customers and users? Uh, that's the first thing we're going to talk about. Then we'll talk a little bit about the internals of Amazon Lex, what the service actually is, how it interplays with other AWS services, because there's one key integration between Lex and another AWS service that is used really importantly for enrichment of the experience. Okay, So Lex provides certain uh, out-of-the-box capabilities for natural language processing. But to really customize and build applications from that, we need another component. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll just jump straight into the AWS console, and we'll show you the user experience for deploying bots. We'll show you the user experience for managing bots in, in production. I'll do a quick demo of uh, Facebook Messenger for access, and then I'll ask you to interact with the system as well. Okay, So that's basically how this session will go. And then at the end, we'll have a look at some results from your interaction. Because I've got a full-blown app that's built out using the service to show you. Okay, So why did we build this tool? This is the first bit of important context, that there is an evolutionary development of HCI, of human-computer interaction. Okay? When we started, uh, it was punch cards and toggling switches on systems to populate registers with instructions Right in the very early days of computing. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to Paris, actually, to uh, give a talk in a vertical industry, also about conversational interfaces, not about Lex, a bit of a, a higher level about why these interfaces are important. And uh, on the agenda with me is a customer who used to be the CTO at Channel 4 Television and now runs his own voice consulting business, so consulting with customers on how to build voice interfaces. First time I gave this talk, he was sitting in the audience, and I said, who remembers this? And unfortunately, Bob Harris put his hand up. He's in the latter end of his career, but he's moved all the way from this right the way over to this. This is what, what he works on now. He's the former CTO at Channel 4 Television in the UK. Really interesting guy. So there are people that have spanned all this stuff. So that was the first gen, anyway. Then, obviously, the CLI established itself as a dominant interaction mechanism. A lot of us probably still use that because for the power users and for people that like automation, obviously, you can do things with the CLI that are quite difficult to achieve with some of these later, more modern interfaces. But you can also do things with these modern interfaces that it's quite difficult to do with the CLI, which I'll talk about in a second. Okay, But moving beyond that intermediary step, then we get into uh, Xerox Park. We get into Apple's early interface work. It's the 25th anniversary of Windows 3.1 last week. Makes some of us feel kind of old, OK? Uh, but that was the sort of first incarnation of the mass market GUI as we know it today. And this phase of interface design is really characterized by two major trends. Skeuomorphism, which is taking the physical world and transporting it into the digital world. OK, so you've got a notebook app on your iPad, and it's got a spiral ring down the left-hand side that looks like a real, real notebook. It's kind of fallen from favor now, but techniques like folders uh, and files, icons, they're another form of skeuomorphism. And then the second big trend is what I just mentioned, 
point and click, so use of the mouse to navigate the interface. It's great. One thing that it does give you over CLI is it gives you kind of portability of analog from the real world into the digital world, and it, that makes these systems more accessible, right? We can kind of navigate our way around files and folders without necessarily having to be told explicitly that to access that document, you have to click into the expenses folder and then double click on that file. It's kind of, it comes naturally to the user, right? And then continuing on that, that continuum, uh, what comes more naturally than just asking for what you want, you know? Uh, Alexa, what is the weather going to be in Munich on Tuesday? What is the weather going to be in Paris on Thursday? What's the travel time to Manchester Airport? Now, some of the things that I'm talking about or describing to you there have quite a bit of inherent complexity, okay, which I'm going to come back to in a second. But the basic premise here with these voice-based interfaces, with these conversational interfaces, is there's no user training at all. You don't have to explain to a customer how to use the system. With experimentation and with the right interface design, the system can be self-describing rather than self-documenting. Okay, So I don't, I don't understand what you mean. It's a kind of natural prompt to try something else. So you can build systems like that. And, and again, there's hidden complexity within that, which we're going we're gonna to talk about in a second. So we've been down, this, uh, been down this path of interface design. There's a couple of unusual things that happen on the right-hand side of this picture. Uh, the first unusual thing that happens is, I think, the unexpected but overwhelming popularity of devices like the Amazon Echo. Okay? I don't think anybody at Amazon uh, expected that this device, which was called Doppler in its first prototype, by the way, there's actually an Amazon building in Seattle called Doppler, and that was the code name for the Echo before it was... Uh, before it was launched. I don't think anybody that was working on the Doppler project envisaged that that device would be as important, as popular, and as transformational as it has been. Okay, it was the top-selling product on Amazon.com in the run-up to Christmas 2017 was the Echo Dot, the small form factor version of this device. Millions and millions and millions of units have been shipped. Who's got one? Okay, we're in a market here which is kind of a late market. We didn't launch in Germany until uh, a couple of years ago, right? And also, we're in a market which is super, super pri privacy sensitive, but you're all willing to have that device in your home and talk to it, okay? Now, there's a lot of value in the device, and that's the reason that people are so enthusiastic about it. And a lot of that value comes from another really significant thing that happens over on the right-hand side here, which is accessibility, okay? With these interfaces, you can make applications and services available to individuals and groups that were locked out of access. If you're blind or visually impaired or very young or very old, or you have dementia or some other disability which inhibits you from interacting with this type of interface, if you can put the same capabilities behind a voice or conversational interface, all of a sudden they become accessible to you. Imagine if you'd never been able to use Google because you had degraded vision and couldn't see the screen. All of a sudden, with voice interfaces, you can communicate with information sources and with applications that a lot of us take for granted. This is really transformational in terms of opening up information systems and apps to new constituencies and making them available to individuals that might historically have been excluded. I heard a customer say that an elderly member of their family has dementia, but Alexa never gets bored of telling that person what day of the week it is. I mean, you're laughing about it, but it can be a great social aid for individuals that are in situations like that, that just want to have the ability to ask a simple question and have a simple answer without having anybody getting frustrated with them probably makes that individual feel like less of a burden, less of a weight on the family, and it also makes sure that they have access to the info that they need to have a happier and more productive life. Okay, so there's a lot of social good that comes out of, of these devices as well. Now, of course, there's a drawback with the Amazon Echo and there's a drawback with Alexa, which is that you have to have the device. So if you want to deploy a voice application, make it accessible to your customers, your customers is bounded within the set of individuals that happen to own this device, okay? And if it's a custom skill, it's bounded by the set of individuals that know about the existence of the skill and have chosen to activate it on their particular 
set of echo devices or their particular echo device. Okay, so probably the power users like you and me, we've got a harmony remote in our homes to drive our TV maybe. We're comfortable with integrating that with the Amazon Echo and I can walk into my lounge and say turn on the lights or turn on the TV and that happens. Okay, but for a large proportion of the population, that's a difficult thing to do and they maybe don't have the technical skills or awareness to go through a process like that. What we wanted to do with Lex was create a service that allows developers to integrate conversational applications into existing apps, okay? Or take those conversational interfaces into locations where their customers are already present. I'm thinking here about integrating with things like Facebook Messenger, with other messaging, text, and voice-based chat systems that might exist today. Okay, maybe contact centers might be another good example of that. We want to take intelligent agents and conversational interfaces out and make them available in the environments where our customers are already active and where our customers are already present. Or as I said before, integrate them into pre-existing apps. The kind of stuff you can do with, uh, with Lex is embed a push to talk button inside a mobile app. Let's say we've got a hotel or travel app, okay? Press to talk on the mobile app, just say what you want to your phone. We'll capture the audio in the client side component that you develop. We'll ship that off to Amazon Lex as an encoded, encoded audio file. We'll run that through our speech recognition engine, through our natural language understanding engine. We'll figure out the customer's intent. We'll render an audio file in response, send it back to the app, and that will play out of the app. So you can embed natural language interfaces directly within mobile apps through that kind of approach. And that whole process will happen in under 100 milliseconds, by the way. So it's you know, normal conversation without a delay while we have processing. Second thing we might do is take the same business logic, the same chat engine, and deploy it onto our Facebook page so that our customers can click to messages. I want to book a hotel. Do you have availability in Berlin on Thursday the 24th of whatever? The same business logic can understand the written word figure out what the customer's asking for, structure and create a written response, and send that back to the Facebook Messenger API so it pops up inside the customer's chat session. That's what the service does. It is the front end for automatic speech recognition and natural language understanding. Okay. Now, of course, we've tried to tackle some of the other challenges that are present in this domain as well. Uh, scalability, security, access to back-end services, making it easy to encapsulate business logic and run it on demand. These are all problems, challenges, that we've tried to solve uh, by using the service. And I'll talk about a few of these things when I get to uh, discussing the demo in a little bit more detail uh, later on. Okay, now I used a couple of phrases earlier on uh, in this talk, automatic speech recognition and natural language understanding. I just want to dive into those two topics because they are important components of the service. ASR, automatic speech recognition, is taking an encoded audio file and it's converting into a, into a sequence of tokens, into a sequence of words, right? So I want to book a flight or book me a flight from Leeds to London or is it possible for me to fly on Thursday from Munich to London? I'm going to get a different sequence of tokens for each one of those utterances, right? Because I'm saying something different. But I'm actually saying something which is quite similar. Those are all expressions of an intent to want to book a flight, right? So that's what the NLU is. The NLU, at its core, is a classification engine. So it's using deep learning models to figure out of the intents that are specified for this particular chatbot, which is the most likely intent that corresponds to the utterance that I just captured or that I just heard. Okay, so it's gonna use a probability-based assessment. Those are all quite likely on my assessment to fit into that flight booking. But what if I said I want to hire a car or I want a hotel room in Munich? Then that might, well, should, be classified into the car hire or hotel booking intent and trigger a different set of logic, right? So there is a classification engine that's running here that's going to bucket the utterances and associate, with the, associate them with the highest probability intent. If we don't trigger any of those 
classifications, in other words, every option is low probability, then we've got what we call in our uh, terminology a missed utterance, an utterance that hasn't been classified. That'll end up in another reporting bucket that we can then use to prioritize the backlog of new utterances that we want to add to our, add to our chatbot. Okay, and you'll see that in the interface in a bit. That's the easy part of NLU. Okay? Easier part of NLU. The more challenging part is when we start to enrich the utterance with additional information that might be relevant to fulfillment to the transaction that we have in mind. I want to fly from Munich to London. Munich is my origin. London is my destination. I want to fly from Munich to London on Thursday with British Airways. I've now got my origin destination, my, my day of travel, and my carrier at 3 p.m. All of a sudden, I've got my time in there as well. So hope you can appreciate that there are millions, hundreds of thousands, millions of different ways in which we can express the same intent with different degrees of enrichment. And to create a natural interface, we don't want to come back and ask the user for something that they've already specified. Okay? We don't want to say in response to that, which day would you want to travel on? That'll be more frustrating, very, very frustrating for me. So NLU is also about entity extraction. Okay? It's about pulling out the pertinent entities from the utterance, enabling them to pre-populate those into a data model so that we can either package up all of the information that we have and send that off for immediate fulfillment. Yes, there's a flight at three. It costs 179 euros. Would you like to book? Okay. Or we can dynamically generate a back and forth of conversation to populate the missing slots. Which day do you want to travel on? At what time? With which carrier? Okay, we have a flight at 3 o'clock on Thursday with British Airways. Do you wish to book? Yes, I do. But we don't want to have to codify that. We don't want to have to write software which generates the back channel to populate those slots, do we? That would be very, very time consuming, especially if we've got a lot of different utterances that we want to cater for within our particular application use case. So there's a generative component to the deep learning technology that's used here we generate the outbound as well. So you just specify what the slots are, and we create the voice or text to populate them. When do you want to travel? On what date? And with which airline? And those phrases will be generated automatically in order to populate the data model that's required to fulfill that particular transaction type, okay? to fulfill that intent, essentially. So that's what the service does. Any questions on that? OK, let's jump in and take a look at the console. OK, it's my uh, favorite way to show this service, really. Okay. OK, we're on the console there in the North Virginia region. You can see that I've already got a bot provisioned in North Virginia. We're active in two regions with this right now, by the way, North Virginia and in Dublin in Ireland. OK, so I'm going to return to that uh, later on. I want to show you the first run experience. So I'll jump over to a region where we don't currently have a Lex bot provisioned. And you should have seen something like this if you've used an AWS service or tried to create an AWS service where you don't already have an instance of that service in existence. We call this our first run experience. It's intended to provide a bit of integrated documentation that walks a customer through how to use the service. So we have a getting started option here, which we can select. Okay? And you'll see there are several template bots available to us here. Custom provisioning, book trip, order flowers, or schedule appointment. Okay? Uh, so we'll take a look at those. And each one of them has representative dialogue available to take a look at here. Okay, so for book trip, typical utterances, I'd like to book a hotel. And then we're going to be asked in which city, in New York City, date, are you sure you want to? Yes, so there's confirmation there as well in that dialogue flow that you can see. Okay, so I'm going to provision this one into my account uh, in Dublin, Ireland. Okay, and what's happening now behind the scenes is a JSON representation of the configuration required for this particular bot instance is being provisioned into my account. Okay? 
you can see that it's just building at the moment. So the JSON representation gets provisioned in, and then the custom language models that are required for the intent resolution and the slot elicitation, they get provisioned as well. Okay, so first of all, you get the JSON template, and then the work that's required to configure the NLP system takes place. Okay? And while that's happening, uh, we can scroll down a little bit and show you these examples. Okay? So sample utterances, these are the training data that are used for the classification of intents, the resolution of intents. Okay? So I provide representative utterances that will be used to train the model uh, for intent resolution. You can see the car reservation ones there. And if I jump over into the flight booking intent, oh, sorry, the hotel booking intent, you see the hotel bookings. Notice how I've got some of them where I've got entities that are embedded directly within the utterances. Okay? So I can train for that as well. Okay? And then further down, it's just. Uh, Further down, you can see that I'm specifying the entities or slots that are required in order to fulfill this particular intent. A pickup city, a date, a return date, a driver age, and a car type. Okay? And that's it. I'm just going to return parameters to the client. And once I've provisioned to this stage, I can then interact with the chatbot natively within the AWS console. So we provide a test console for that. Okay? And this is when the bot's been built but before it's been published. When I talk about publishing, that means I'm going to make this particular chatbot available on specific channels, okay? And also make it available via the Lex runtime service, which is a service that you might use if you're taking the approach that I described before of using audio capture, okay? So in that case, our iOS or Android or React Native SDK is going to be sending those encoded audio, audio objects to the Lex runtime API. Okay, and that's where you're going to be doing your ASR, your NLU, and we're going to be issuing responses back to you in response to your API requests there. Okay, but I can interact with the bot natively directly within the console, and I can say something like hire a car. First thing to know is this isn't in the sample utterances. Okay? Hire is obviously a synonym for book. I've trained with book, but that gives the model resolute the intent resolution model enough capability to accurately classify the intent okay so what city do you want to rent uh, munich right i'm going to start my rental yesterday it's obviously impossible okay and i'm entering that data cuz i want to show you a couple of things first of all that there is no business logic or validation behind this interface right now so i can enter anything which fits into the data type associated with the slot okay so there's no validation Second thing I want to show you is natural language resolution of dates. So if you look down here, you'll see that pickup date is actually set to the ISO date for yesterday. Okay, so we have some very sophisticated capabilities around things like natural language understanding of dates. Uh, if I just shrink this down a bit, you'll see that for the dates, I'm using an, a built-in here called Amazon.date, which is one of our built-in slot types. Okay, and that has integrated into it powerful natural language understanding capabilities for date data types. Okay, so I could have said a week on Thursday or Christmas Day 2016 or the last day of January, okay? And it will resolve all of those things down to ISO dates using the natural language engine that is built into the system. Okay, and there are many other built-in slot types which have similar capabilities, okay? including one specific for Germany, such as DE city, DE region, German first names. These are ported across from the Amazon Echo, Alexa voice service, and Alexa skills kit. So if you've worked with that, you should be familiar with some of these data types. Okay, uh, so that allows us to re resolve dates, okay? And then we can conclude our transaction. I can also enter other invalid data, like the fact the driver is 13. Again, there's no business rules. There's no logic behind this. Okay, and I can rent a mid-sized vehicle. Now all of my slots will show as populated. You'll see my dialogue state switches to confirm intent. I have you down. Should I book the reservation? Yes. And that'll dispatch to a ful fulfillment function if we configure one. You'll see right now we don't have a fulfillment function configured down here. 
So that's really the front end of Amazon Lex in, in action with the ASR. We're not using ASR because we're using text, but there would be ASR there if we're using voice, plus the natural language understanding engine. Okay. Now, enriching this with more business logic, well, the clue's already there in the console as to how we're going to do that. So for custom dialogue flows, for business logic, for validation, for uh, fulfillment, we use AWS Lambda for that. Okay, so you can see that we can configure Lambda functions for initialization and validation and also for fulfillment. So we'll provision a Lambda function in this region specifically for that purpose. And you'll find uh, in our blueprints, we have Lambda functions for Lex for these examples which are already available. This one's called Book Trip Python. It's the back end for... Uh, this particular chatbot, so I'll call that in. And I will provision it, create function. That's now provisioned, and I can integrate that. I need to reload the console here. I can integrate that directly into my bot now by just selecting that Lambda function from these drop downs. So my Lambda additionization function, uh, demo Munich, permission to invoke. And fulfillment, same thing, demo Munich. Yep. Okay, now if I do the same things, so book a car, I want to rent in Munich, you'll immediately see that the validation kicks in. Ah, that's unusual. Ah, oh, hang on. So I need to save my intent. So I save, build my intent. So reconfigure the intent to take advantage of those configuration changes that I just made. That'll just take a second. While that happens, I'll just grab the uh, code for that and show you it. At least I'll try to. Okay. So, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Lambda, this is our serverless code execution service. Okay, and when invoking a Lambda function from Lex, we're working with request and response documents. Okay, so when this validation, initialization and validation code hook is triggered, what's happening in the back end is a document describing the state of the session and current dialogue with Amazon Lex is being sent to my Lambda function was event context, okay, so a fixed format document. The Lambda function is written to interpret the values, the contents of that document, and to respond in accordance with those values. It's kind of abstract, okay, so let me show you uh, what I mean, okay? So this is the input event format, okay, so my Lambda function is going to receive a document in this format. The current intent, the slot details, the confirmation status, details about the bot, such as the name, alias, and version, the user ID, the input transcript of the text, the invocation source, whether it's dialog code hook, fulfillment and initialization, or fulfillment code hook, obviously for fulfillment, the output dialog mode, the session attributes, and the request attributes. Okay, so I get that fixed format document. I process that with my Lambda function, and I create an output document, okay, uh, which is like this, okay, sending back session attributes and a dialogue action for the Lex engine to take in response, okay. And by using this back and forth of request and response documents, I can build the kind of features that I talked about with validation, fulfillment business logic, and other things. And if you take a look in the code base for this particular example function, you'll see that I have an intent router here that expects either the book hotel or book car intent, okay? And then for each of those different intents, I have business logic which extracts the slot values, 
performs validation functions, okay, either accepts the slot values or resets them, okay, and then it prompts Lex to move forward with the next step in the dialogue, okay, soliciting or eliciting the next slot or moving forward to fulfillment if all slots are populated, okay? And it's writing code in that programming model that enables us to deliver uh, features like this. So book a car, Munich. Uh, we do not so currently support Munich as a valid destination. Please choose a valid destination city. So you can see that I've now got my back-end business logic in play. New York, okay, yesterday was the test case that I used before, right? Uh, no, you can't pick up in the past. Can you try a different date? Tomorrow, day after tomorrow. How old is the driver for this rental? 13, no, not old enough, at least 18, 21. Type of, type of car do you want, mid-size? Shall I book this reservation? Yes. Thank you, I've placed your reservation. So it's not just the reflect back, it's a dummy message indicating fulfillment. Okay, so by combining the request response format with an appropriate programming model at the back end using Lambda, we can customize and build very sophisticated dialogue flows that have validation, business logic, fulfillment logic, link out into third party systems for those purposes, either for validation or fulfillment. Do anything else that you can express within the programming language that you choose to use there. And of course, you can use any supported programming language for Lambda. Okay, so that's the getting started experience, very, very simple. As well as uh, directly provisioning the function code into Lambda, you can also download it, okay, which is how I got hold of that source. Okay? And you can use that as the basis, of course, for your own chatbots. Okay? So that's a really good starting point if you want to develop uh, your own systems of this type. Right, full-blown demo time. Please do this. Okay? It really helps make this session work properly. If nobody does it, the next bit will be really rubbish. So inside Facebook Messenger, you'll find a button at the bottom that says people, okay? And if you point that, and then, so if you click that button which says people at the bottom, okay, you'll then see scan code, okay? And if you scan that code, you'll then get dropped directly into a chat session with my endpoint, okay? And you can say, first of all, something like, what is your Twitter or what is your GitHub, okay? So that's a good first question to ask. Uh, just give you a second to do that. If you don't have Facebook Messenger on your phone, but you do have a Facebook account, you can hit this URL, okay? Remember the dot AWS on the end, that'll take you to my page rather than to my personal account. And you can issue the same things via the message button on the Facebook page. That's how we're integrated. We're integrated with the Facebook messaging API here, okay? So the first thing is, what is your Twitter? What is your email? What is your GitHub, okay? Uh, and you'll get an immediate response back to that. Then you can ask for help, okay? And then you'll get some more guidance, okay? And I'll just show you uh, how this works. Has everybody that wants to do this got that? Uh, can I zoom in on this code? That's a good question. I guess I can. If I do that, do this. How's that? It's kind of weird looking at my face quite so big. It's almost like for your vein, yeah. Okay, but the URL also works, okay. So from the user's perspective, the way that you might interact with this, of course, is to use, uh, is to use a web-based experience, okay. And for the web-based experience, with the Facebook page, uh, as a page admin, I see the test button option in this menu here, but as a user, you don't see that. You just click on there, and you get the same effect as hitting the test button option. So I'm going to do that, OK? And then I'm dropped into a dialogue. I'll come back to this in a second, the testing. And I can do the same thing that you've just done. I can say, uh, what is your email, for example? And uh, within 100 milliseconds or so, I'm getting a response back. So this is the Lexbot integrated with Facebook. We'll talk about how the integration works in a second. I can say, help get something else back. Uh, and then I can say something like this. I want to rate a session. Let's just describe what I built this for, first of all. So the reason this was built was because evangelists, we go out and talk to a lot of customers. We do a lot of public talks, as well as a lot of talks in AWS events. It's kind of difficult to get feedback 
if you're not running the event. So we might get some CSAT scores, or we might get some ad hoc comments, but we can't really do anything structured that you might consider data for performance assessment or for continuous improvement. And I really wanted to know how the stuff that I was doing, talking about, was landing with the audiences. And I started thinking about how could I actually build a system that would make it easier to capture feedback. And that's actually what this is for. So you can say, I want to rate a session. It will ask you what talk, when, where, and then you can give a score between one and five. So it's like a simple CSAT, OK? And I just capture that, have some dashboards at the back end, and I can see over time where my scores are and how I'm doing. Then on the feedback, this came a little bit later, you can say I want to leave feedback, when, where, what session. And then you just get, leave some free, free form feedback, like a few comments, OK? Actually use sentiment analysis on the comments to figure out if they're positive, negative, or neutral. But also have the long form text, so I can actually see a little bit of feedback about how I'm doing. That's the use case that it's intended to support. So it's really simple. But it also makes for quite an interesting Lex demo. When you give a Lex talk, and you ask people to give feedback on the talk using Lex. That's quite, quite cute. So you can, yeah, I can rate a session. So uh, let's say Lex. It's today, of course. We're in Munich. Uh, and I can leave a score, you know, four. Do I want to submit? No, because I don't want to pollute my data set. But I'd encourage you all to do that, either now or into the talk, and run through the transaction, maybe leave a bit of freeform feedback. And if you do that, then we'll have a nice dashboard that we can show at the end of the talk as well. So that's the uh, user experience. Oh, thanks for the like. I did this on stage in Singapore in front of like 2,500 people. Singaporeans do not have the same reservations about Facebook that people do in Germany. And my <laughs> screen was just <laughs> Filled with, filled with likes and friends requ friend requests and hundreds of comments. So it was kind of cool. It worked pretty well. Which shows one of the nice things about AWS Lambda, of course, which is there's no back end to provision. So I didn't have to scale anything to do that. I just increased my account limit, and I knew that I would be able to deal with whatever transaction volume I got. So it's kind of cool to use the serverless back end in that way as well. And then on the, uh, on the bot definition itself, uh, you'll see here there's quite a bit more richness here than we saw in that representative example that we saw before. The first thing is we've got a lot more utterances. Okay, So we've got a lot of different utterances. I'll come to the talk about the cancel request in a bit. So on the email info, for example, people typo. Okay, So tell me you email wasn't getting picked up. So I inserted that into the training set. How did I know it wasn't getting picked up? Well, on error handling down here, you can monitor, OK? And you can look at utterances. Uh, and you can look at missed utterances. There's none on 32. These are versions, by the way. We have versioning. So these are all the missed utterances that I had from my uh, Singaporean experience, where I need to integrate some of these. So say I wanted to add this one into my what is your GitHub. Well, I can just go like that. And it will automatically add that particular missed utterance into that intent. So it provides a really simple way for expanding the training set based on actual real world data that you're capturing from the system in use. It's a really nice mechanism for establishing this feedback loop, which over time will make the bot more accurate. There's a lot of stuff in here. OK, yeah, a lot of training data. So that probably should be in the, uh, that's actually a slot type that we need to train that one into. So I need to do that a bit later on in a different way. But yeah, so that's the, Missed utterances. And then uh, for these simple request response examples, we no longer need a back end. Okay? So for a simple question like, what is your email? Well, I just want to tell the client what my email is. So you can just populate those directly in this messages selection window. The more you put in, the more random options will be picked from in response. So it gives more of a human-like feel to the response that is provided. But if all you want to do in response to a particular intent is fulfill an information request, you can do that natively within the console without needing any code, which is kind of nice. Okay, uh, And then for things that are more complex, like provide feedback or rate session, where we've got actual slots that we want to populate, then we're back into the same thing, which is Lambda functions at the back end. Okay, And for this, I have a code base, which is uh, based off the book trip code base that you've just seen, but obviously mod modified for this particular use case. Uh, and that is here. Okay, And you'll see there are things in here like uh, you know, validating 
how recently the feedback is being provided. So get day difference. Uh, if we have feedback provided that's older than 30 days, I want to reject that and say you can only provide feedback on sessions in the last 30 days. So I have validation functions for that, checking whether things are in the future, checking if uh, they're in a valid location that I've actually visited. Then we've got our sentiment analysis code here. For sentiment analysis, we're using another AWS service called Amazon Comprehend, which is a very simple sentiment analysis service. Just send it text fragments, and it sends you back a positive, negative, or neutral about the comment that you've provided. So I enrich that in, OK? And then uh, ultimately, we end up fulfilling the intents by printing a message that says, thanks for the feedback or thanks for the rating and dispatching a data object that contains information about the feedback or rating into a Kinesis stream, which then ends up in S3 or in Elasticsearch, and that's how we do our viz. Okay, so let me show you the overall architecture, because it will make what I've just described a, a little bit clearer. Okay, so the front end, Amazon Lex, intent resolution, session management, our slot extraction, and our channels, which we'll talk about in a second. AWS Lambda for those more feature-rich validation processes that we need to run, our sentiment analysis where it's applicable, and we package up our data object and we drop it into that Kinesis stream for reliable ingest. And then ultimately, we deliver that into Elasticsearch and just added a new function feature quite recently where we also deposit them into S3, use Amazon Athena, which is our serverless analysis service, and I have a QuickSight dashboard in front of that that allows me to visualize the data that's being collected. Okay, so that's the overall architecture. On channel integration, because uh, I, I said channel integration, I'd return to that in a second. Uh, we've got webhooks, okay, and we have a very simple setup process for establishing integrations with Facebook Messenger, Kick, which is a messaging app, Slack, and Twilio for SMS, okay. And what's happening here is we're establishing bidirectional webhook integration. So when my Facebook page receives a message, it's configured to hit a webhook, which is exposed by the Lex service. Okay? It sends the utterance, the ID, your unique Facebook ID, which is just your long UUID number from Facebook to identify you, uh, plus a signature, which is applied using a cryptographic shared secret. Okay? That hits a webhook endpoint within Amazon. We send that to the Lex runtime API. We figure out what we want to say back again. We send that over to the uh, corresponding endpoint in Facebook, referencing the UUID, providing the response, signing with a cryptographic shared secret, and then that pops up in your Facebook Messenger. Okay, and that back and forth is the way in which the channel integration takes place. Exactly the same for Twilio. I have Twilio SMS integration. It's not currently active, but when I did this in Singapore, I had a plus 65 local SMS number. People could interact via SMS as well. Exactly the same business logic at the back end, just another channel that you open up. Okay? And you can integrate with Twitter for direct messages or even for public messaging on Twitter using Twitter's direct messaging API or their new account activity API. You can integrate with corporate chats, chat systems if you as well can hit a webhook endpoint, okay? And we can establish those automatically for these four channels, or you can run your webhook receiving endpoints on API Gateway and use Lambda to integrate with the Lex runtime service. Okay, so that's how you can build uh, those integrations. Okay, shall we uh, take a look at the data from your feedback? This is where things start to get nervous for me. I don't know if you've been, if you've been kind or not or been mean, so we'll see. Okay. Uh, so a quick site. This is our uh, BI tool, by the way, if you're not familiar with it. And in combination with Athena, which is our serverless analytics service, it allows us to deposit a collection of JSON objects inside an S3 bucket prefix, OK? and then use a DDL to apply a schema to those objects. So we don't have a table, per se, in a database anywhere here. We just have one JSON object per fulfillment of the intents that I provided. Okay? And then we apply a schema on top of that, and we use that to provide visualization and analysis. So how have we done? Uh, yeah, so 16 people uh, provided feedback. 
or gave a rating. Okay, and I believe that if we double click on this, we can focus only on Munich. We can apply that filter condition to all value, all visuals. Okay. Okay, so we got one piece of narrative feedback, uh, which was positive. We got 15 scores uh, with an average of 4.6. Score distribution was like this, so nine fives and nine fours. Okay, uh, 16 records in total. Great, I like the interactive part. Thank you very much. Who wrote that? Anyone want to volunteer? Thank you very much. That's really kind of you. That was positive with 98% polarity. Okay. So that is basically how you can build a pipeline. Yeah. Oh. Only the number. OK, it's a anonymous. We'll attribute that to Anon for now. OK, but that is how you can build a pipeline to uh, visualize the kind of data that you might collect from this sort of system. But of course, you can do whatever you want. In our fulfillment, obviously, we have our uh, snippet here that deposits our record, which is structured like this, by the way. Uh, this is what our records look like. It deposits our record into Kinesis, but that could be fulfillment into another back-end API or any other kind of integration it wanted to build. It's just really representative for the purposes of, of showing, uh, showing the demo. OK, uh, there's two other things to show, actually. So these are questions that are asked sometimes, so let's preempt them. Uh, I've got a test intent here. Uh, the test intent allows me to enter a, a slot value which is out of range, so not A, B, or C. Okay? And I'm generating a response card here rather than a text-based response. Okay? Now, these response cards, they're very valid on, valid on the Facebook and Twilio channels. Okay? So you can, sorry, Facebook and Slack channels, not Twilio. Facebook and Slack channels. Okay? And you generate one response card with your response document from your function or from the randomized responses that are available to you within the console using appropriate markup. We transcode it for either Slack or for Facebook, so into the right markup for the particular plat platform. And then we send it over to the channel endpoint, okay, and it gets rendered. What's special about them is that they are touch enabled for Facebook on the mobile platform. So if I have several options that I want to provide to a customer for a particular slot, I can actually turn the A, B, and C values into those values. Do you want to get a small, medium, or large car, or a basic, standard, or deluxe room? Okay, And it's touch enabled, which is really nice for Facebook Messenger on a mobile device. A bit quicker than asking people to type things in. Okay, You can also enrich this with a title and a subtitle, and also with an image. So you can put an image in there if you want. You can actually put images in the options as well, but it gets a bit unwieldy with the touch interface on a phone if you do that, but you can do it. Okay, so that's an option that you have available to you. And then something else that I've been asked about uh, is uh, populating slots programmatically. Okay, so sometimes I might have valid or a complete set of options for a slot that are built in another system. You know, maybe it's a list of all of the branches that I have in my hotel chain or my restaurant chain as part of a branch finder or as a booking system. And I want to programmatically use that data via a pipeline to create all of the valid values for a particular slot. Okay? We have a model building API as well as the runtime API that I've talked about. And you can use that model building API to programmatically create models, but also to programmatically load data into slot values. Okay, so this is a notebook, a Jupyter notebook, that includes an example of loading UK postcode data into slots to enable those slots to be resolved. You'll see there's uh, 2.582 million postcodes in the UK. Okay, uh, and using this uh, notebook, we basically extract a thousand samples from that. We create a list object, okay, which you can see some samples from here, okay, and then we populate that list object into Amazon Lex via the model building API, okay. So it allows us to automatically, sorry, it allows us to automatically update a slot with a set of training values 
that can then be used for slot resolution. And we can manipulate the models in general terms using the same approach. So you can put Lex into a pipeline or the end of a pipeline and use data products for part of the data products that you create with other tools for part of the pipeline. It's a, a kind of advanced topic, but something that quite a few uh, customers were asking me about. So I built this notebook to, uh, to help customers see how you might do that. But it's basically just calling the put slot type method on the client API. This is uh, Buzzer 3, by the way, if you're not familiar with our. Python SDK, and that's how I do the slot population. Okay, good, good example of that. I could actually load all 2.5 million values in if I wanted to and have a validate where customers were forced to pick from them. Uh, but when I tried to do that, uh, I hit a rate limit on the service, and the service team went ballistic with me, so I thought I'd better use a sample instead. Okay, full disclosure. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to make the slot permissible options list uh, longer, than, uh, longer than the limit that's there. OK, so does anyone have any questions? Probably the first question is, is this available in German? The answer is not yet, but we are working on that at the moment. OK. There is an open source project where a customer puts a translation API in front of Lex, like in line, and that open source project supports 125 different languages. We currently support English. So we have a bit of work to do on extending the language support. Yes. That's a good question. I, I don't know because obviously the feature is not released yet, but it would seem to make sense to me that you would be able to create multi-language bots. Uh, something else you could do, though, would be to use our Comprehend service, which does language detection. Okay, So if you are writing your own client at the front end, or maybe we will build this into the service, maybe we will build it into the service, would be to have language detection before you dispatch to a language-specific back end, you know, figure out whether that's German or English. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. In the example I put in, I want to give feedback in Unix as opposed to base. Yeah. Um, and it didn't get that. Yeah, because I didn't train it. You didn't train it in the sample. Correct. Is there any more efficient way instead of adding the sample? Like, for example, that I picked up this text in base or in other locations? No. No, you need, to train you need to train for that. Yeah, so your utterance in a few minutes or hours will appear in my missed utterance list, OK? And then I'll be able to see that there. That's not updated in real time. It's batched, OK? But at the end of the day, I'll go back and take a look at that. And then I'll have something else that I can think about in terms of the next iteration. But it's a good piece of feedback, and I think I should enrich for that. So I will do that. Yeah. Question, yeah. Can you use Alexa as a channel? You can't use Alexa as a channel, but you can do this, OK? Uh, session feedback bot, actions. Export, bot version, 32, platform, Alexa skills kit. OK, so it, you can only go one way, by the way, today. So you can only go from Lex to the Alexa skills kit. But you can take the logic that you've built here in the understanding model and export that and import it as an Alexa skill. You can also, as you saw in the drop down, export as Lex and use this to deploy bots in second regions or to version control your definition. Uh, which I have done. If you jump into the uh, repo for this demo, which you'll find on my GitHub, you'll see that not only is uh, the backend function available in the repo, the Python function available, but if you look in this Lex export directory, you'll find the full definition. So you can actually import that and establish the system for yourself for testing purposes if you want to do so. It's just the reverse of what I showed you, which is you create the... Uh, outline and instead of export you import okay, so that will overwrite my bot with whatever's in that JSON file. I can actually edit the JSON file in an IDE if I want, add my new utterances there and import it back in and those will then get reflected in the console when I reload it. Okay, so you can work either on the definitions or in the GUI that we provide. Any other questions? Okay, if you didn't want to admit that you use Facebook in this room in front of everyone, the feedback system is always up. So you can always find me on Facebook at ian.massingham.aws and leave me some comments. I'm always collecting data. Thank you.